Unfortunately, there are some truths that are disheartening. And what we have to do is realistically work from that point to try to come up with some kind of a solution that is actually workable rather than retreat into fantasies, half-truths, and deceptions that are much more comforting, much more heartening, but unfortunately false. Now, in this case, if there is a permanent state of war existing between the uh, House of Islam, the Dar al-Islam, and the House of War, the Dar al-Harb, which is us, then it is because Muslims who believe these teachings are waging it and always have been waging it. And the only times in history when there has not been widespread jihad violence in the world is at times when the Islamic community was too weak to put it forward, but not because there was any large-scale reform of these teachings, rejection of these teachings, even reconsideration of these teachings. This is not to say that every Muslim in the world is our enemy, should be our enemy, or ever will be fighting against us. Because as in, in Islam, as in every other religious tradition, there is a spectrum of belief of knowledge and of fervor. There are many millions of people around the world, billions in fact, who call themselves Christians. And yet, to con assume that they all agree on Christian doctrine or that they all will act upon Christian doctrines that they agree on would be absurd. There is a huge variation in how those people who call themselves Christians live out their Christianity or are Christians essentially in name only and ignore part or all of it. It's the same way in Islam. These things are teachings of all the schools of Islamic law. These things are manifestly taught in the Quran. They are taught in the example of Muhammad, who has Uswa Hassana, the perfect example, the supreme, excellent example of conduct as specified in the Quran, is to be imitated, held up as a model for emulation in Islamic theology. And as these things are taught, then there are people who will take them seriously. There are people who will not take them seriously. There are people who will hear them and believe them, but not be willing to give up their comfortable lives. They just want to have a job and a family. They just want to be left alone. They don't really, can't really be bothered with all these theological issues. There is also, because of the great Western influence, including the influence of Western pop culture, which has been so derided in the Islamic world, there is also a widespread acceptance of Western sentiments of Western notions of human rights that are at variance with classical notions of Islamic law. The Quran, not Spencer, not uh, some extremists, mandates amputation of the hand for theft. That's chapter 5, verse 38. Uh, the Hadith, the Islamic traditions and Islamic law are unanimous on that. They are unanimous on the stoning of adulterers. They are unanimous on the institutionalized subjugation of women in many ways. But the world is not, the Islamic world is not hermetically sealed. Western ideas have come in. And there are millions, hundreds of millions of Muslims who do subscribe to Western notions of human rights, Western notions of the dignity of all people and the equality of rights of all people before the law. These people can be our allies. But both within the Islamic world and in terms of the Islamic world's relations to the West, these things cannot come about if we don't acknowledge the situation first. You can't reform what you won't admit needs reforming. You can't fix what you won't admit is broken. The reformers, such as Khaled Abu al-Fadl, whom Dr. Peterson mentioned, are actually uh, people who are not the kind of reformer you would expect. If you're familiar with European history, you're familiar with the Protestant Reformation, whether you were a Catholic or a Protestant, or whether you were neither, then you may know that the Protestant reformers pointed out elements of Catholic theology that they rejected, and they taught against them. They fought against them. They said, we do not believe and we do not think that the church ought to teach transubstantiation, papal authority, veneration of Mary, and so on. They did not say these elements of Christianity do not exist and have never existed, and anybody who thinks so is just helping the extremists. And it's the same way today. If we're going to really help genuine Islamic reformers, we shouldn't, they, then we cannot take those people, and there are many, including some that uh, Dr. Peterson mentioned, who are saying that these elements of Islam do not exist and have never existed. That's not reform, that's deception. We can take as allies those who say there are these elements of Islam and they need to be rethought. There needs to be a fundamental reassessment of how we take even the literal words of the Quran and there may need to be a retreat from, an explicit retreat from literalism in several particulars. But this problem will never go away. This problem will not be solved. This problem will continue to recur if we 
in the first place, forbid ourselves from speaking about it, and we are end up pretending that it doesn't exist and accepting the comforting half-truths and inaccurate formulations of people who have not actually confronted the reality of these things. Just for example, Dr. Peterson mentioned that uh, there are interpretations of the Quran that are put forward by the jihadists today and that I am endorsing them and validating them supposedly by writing about them and reporting on them. And that he reminds me that we have to take into account the Azbab al-Nazul, which is the context of the various verses of the Quran. Well, let me give you a little lesson in Azbab al-Nazul right here, just very briefly. Ibn Ishaq, the first biographer of Muhammad in the 8th century, a pious Muslim, explains the contexts of various Quranic verses about warfare, not necessarily about jihad. As Dr. Peterson points out quite rightly, jihad means struggle. There are many struggles in Arabic, just as there are many struggles in English. You can struggle to quit smoking, and you can have a great struggle against the communist world. It's the same word. But there's no doubt that jihad warfare is an element of this, and there's more. Ibn Ishaq says there are, there are places in the Quran where Muhammad, the Quran teaches peace. Surah 109 of the Quran says, you have, say to the unbelievers, you have your religion and I have mine, essentially let's leave each other alone. That's great. I, would, I, I can go for that. But Ibn Ishaq says there are also portions of the Quran which teach warfare, which say fight against those who have fought against you, but do not begin hostilities. And then there's, a, that's chapter 2, verse 190. And then there are further passages, such as chapter 9, verse 29, which says, fight against the people of the book, that's Jews and Christians primarily, until they pay the jizya, which is the tax, the religion-based tax, specified in Islamic law, with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. In other words, fight against the Jews and Christians until they submit to the rule of the Muslims. Now, Ibn Ishaq says, in context, the first set of verses, verse, uh, the ones that are broadly tolerant, came from the early part of Muhammad's career when he was a preacher, he was not a military leader, and he was essentially powerless. Then when he moved to Medina and he became for the first time a political and military leader, he began to tell the Muslims to defend themselves, and that's the second stage of Quranic revelation, according to Ibn Ishaq, not to Spencer, of the teachings on jihad. And finally, he says that the Quran, because the Muslims are the best of people, that's chapter 3, verse 110, and the unbelievers are the most vile of created beings, that's chapter 98, verse 6, therefore, the Muslims must fight in order to extend their hegemony over the, the world because this is the law of God and they have the responsibility to spread the law of God everywhere. Now, in other words, what he's saying is, is there are three stages of Quranic development on warfare, and the third and final stage that is applicable for all time is warfare against unbelievers. I didn't make that up. That is the earliest biographer of Muhammad. Every biographer of Muhammad since then, including Dr. Peterson, has to rely at least in part on his writings. And that theological point that he makes about the context of the Quranic verses is mainstream Islam taught by all the schools of Islamic law. I am all for Muslims who reject that. I am all for Muslims who say we have to move beyond that. But I do not trust Muslims who say that does not exist and that is not so. That is not reform. Again, that is deception. We need not to be deceived here. We cannot afford to allow ourselves to be deceived. And as Muhammad said, war is deceit. And that war, deception, deliberate lying is allowed in times of warfare, in which we are manifestly in one today, or many Muslims believe we are, and when Muslims are under pressure from unbelievers, as specified by Quran chapter 3, verse 28, they may pretend to be their friends while actually working against them. These things have to be recognized as being elements of Quranic teaching, to the teachings of Muhammad, the teachings of Islamic law. Without that first recognition, there can be no genuine reform and no genuine movement toward any kind of resolution of this conflict. And one thing we can be certain of in that event is that if voices like Dr. Peterson's prevail, the war will continue and intensify for the foreseeable future. Thank you.